I can't believe this is actually working after all this time. All right, is anybody on here? No, not yet. Oh no, we got somebody. Hello. Uh, I'm waiting for the ad to finish so I can make sure that this stream is working. Hey, okay. Whoops. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let me know how it sounds, too. thing so far. Uh, hello everybody! This is um, not really a formalized creative live stream, just really a test of, the, of my setup, making sure it sounds okay, like to you guys. Now, first of all, there's going to be a bit of a delay on the video versus the audio, so the audio is going to be like just a few seconds behind the video. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be too bad. Uh, so this was made for the documentary, um, but it didn't actually end up in it. I used something else in its place because it was a little too like uh, upbeat for what I was going for. So now it's just I can I can do whatever I want with it. Uh, but yeah, this is Cubase, and uh, this is this song that I'm working on. It's not really finished yet. But it's, it has a really cool sound, and I, I'm really into it. Uh, so I'll give you a tour of the track. Um, everything has been built on this one track here at the top. Uh, this is the part that I originally wrote, that I wrote everything else afterwards. Let's solo this. And you can see this. This is the part, and you can hear it. There's... you're gonna get weird sounds when you pause it because it's doing everything in real time and you occasionally get errors uh, anyway so that's that was the core of what this track was um, it's a um, let me see here it's an E minor followed by a D major and then a C major uh, so the E minor goes for two measures, and then you have D major for one measure, and then C major for one measure. And each one of these are chord inversions, so the fifth is inverted, you can see, uh, down to the bottom. So anyway, 
Uh, but for the first part of the uh, track, it just repeats the E minor chord. <clears throat> so then, so I had that, and then I built up on that. So then I added a bass line, and this is the bass line. You can, you can hear it here. I'll solo this. You can see it here. So that's it. Very simple. Um, and then we have a couple of pads that are synth. We have this pad. And then this other pad that does the exact same notes, but it's a new uh, synth. So when you put it all together, and then the melody. And this is a super complicated melody. You can see this crazy movement here. I this is like a month ago or more that I actually wrote this, so I don't quite remember what my process was, but I'm guessing it was like a combination of playing it on the keyboard and programming it with this uh, role editor. Because um, you can place notes, you can do it. Very simple, easy to place notes. So probably, I usually do like a combination of that. Uh, I have a keyboard in front of me, you can't see it. And maybe someday uh, I will um, do like a dual camera setup so it's like you can see the keyboard in front of me. Maybe. I don't know how necessary it is. Anyway, so let's listen to the melody just by itself. And you can, you can kind of see how different a melody sounds when there's nothing, no chords to back it. That's by itself, but it has a lot of like, there's a lot going on. You can hear the, like the echo. I have a huge cathedral reverb on it. So this is the, this little window here gives you track information. So we've got, if you don't know Cubase, so you've got, this is like the mixer thing, this little fader, so you can change the volume. This is uh, sends, so you can do send effects. I don't use send effects that much. Um, this is EQ, so I can alter different, uh, uh, different uh, frequencies so I can like boost or cut different frequencies and these are insert effects and so you can see I've got cathedral reverb on this um, and then I can open that up and then I have like controls for the reverb and so you get like multi-layered windows which is why I have two monitors now but uh, you can only broadcast one monitor so so anyway so you heard the melody by itself oh I've got some questions okay so Allison asks, do you have a formula for starting a new track? Like, do you typically start with melody and then bass and percussion? Uh, it can be kind of different each time. But I often start, the best way to start is like with a chord progression. If I have a good chord progression, then everything else uh, is more likely to fall into place. Um, so... Like, for instance, this is a chord progression. This This beginning part that I showed you guys in the beginning. So let's solo it. I'll play it again. That's E minor. This is D major. And then C major. And then it just repeats that. And that's sort of a chord progression that has been blown out into an arpeggio, or so arpeggiated. Um, and it's really simple. Like, those chords are really simple, but it sounds cool. Uh, sometimes simple chord progressions are the best. <clears throat> Uh, okay, anyway, what was that instrument ensemble used for Reactor on the top track? Oh, okay, that is from Reactor, and Reactor is um, like a synth, like a build-your-own synth tool. Uh, I usually just use the presets, but 
you can it has this like environment where you can build tracks or build uh, synthesizers but it also has a synth called steam pipe which is amazing and you can uh, it sounds really really cool you're also going to find out as you watch these creative live streams that i'm absolutely awful at piano anyway steam pipe uses um physics simulation to simulate like physical uh hollow shapes being struck so you get this really cool like even though it's a synthesizer it has like a really uh warm sound to it so that's the basis of that so okay we heard the melody this one And then that was by itself. And then we can listen to it with the, the very first reactor part that's like the arpeggio that's the core of this. And you can kind of get a better idea of how they sound together. by themselves like that they do kind of fight for attention don't they they kind of talk over each other so maybe it would be good once this melody comes in to turn this down a little so this I can pull this down and this is like a volume curve for the for this part up here and so I can stretch it out to make it a little bit easier to see and then I can do this turn it down a little so let's hear what that sounds like all together. So we're going to start a little bit behind it. We'll start here, and you'll see when it hits the volume. So it's going to turn the volume down right at this point. And you still can't really tell you're probably still doing something good because you, you want to have like the cleanest sound possible uh, okay so the other work changes and becomes so different and interesting yeah this that thing from steam pipe is just like a basic preset like I didn't do anything special well you know it's possible that I like tweaked one or two parameters on it but it's basically just a preset and then I added some reverb to it I think right uh, oh no I added a delay uh, a delay to it and <laughs> apparently really messed with the EQ curve too look at this this is ridiculous um, I'm not sure what I was thinking when I did this but it was like a month ago so um, So, do you guys have any questions? This is actually pretty fun. Um, we should. I, I'm very excited to keep doing stuff like this, for sure. So, oh, well, I can, guess I can go on to the next section here. So, that was the first section, and it was all based around that one chord progression that I showed you. So then we have the second section here, and I add in this bass line. I drop out everything else, Put in this bass line and it sort of adds like a, a sort of rolling energy to it uh, so we're going to start a little bit behind it and then you'll see that you'll hear the instruments drop out and they'll go to the bass line Some questions. 
Is this the first time you're casting this sort of thing? Yes. Uh, well, actually, about an hour ago, I accidentally live streamed stuff when I was testing it. But uh, this is the first time, and I really want to do this like at least once a week, and keep doing it. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a lot more. Second question: It's fascinating to learn a world. Oh, that's not a question. Uh, oh, I thought there was a second question. But oh, how do you know when the song is done? Uh, yeah, that I. That's tough. Usually, I want to like. In general, I want a song to be, I guess, uh, hmm. that is a really great question <laughs> that I may not have a good answer for. I never quite know when a song is done. You usually just kind of have to make a call. You have to be like, well, there's a lot of cool stuff in this track. It goes places. I guess when you, when you feel satisfied that it's told sort of the story that you want it to tell, I know that sounds really abstract, uh, but when you've like, when you made it, you have an idea that you like develop into, into a track and when, when you're making it, you're like, oh, this is really cool. It has a lot of potential and you want to fulfill that potential. And I guess when you've fulfilled the potential and you feel like, okay, it's, it's actually really cool. It has like satisfying movement. Uh, I guess that's when you're like, okay, I should probably wrap this up and figure out a way to, like, end it. And, like, for instance, uh, this track, I feel, has not reached that place of potential. Uh, so, like, I ha it's cool. It has, like, this spot where it, uh, everything drops out and you get this cool bass line and, like, it's kind of rolling feeling. And then a new melody comes in here and then back to the old melody. But I feel like this track needs some kind of like key change or something somewhere around here uh, to give it some more interest and then have it go back to the original, like end with something more like this original part here. So the next step in this track would be to probably either come up with a brand new chord progression or a new like uh, key signature and like go from there. Or like, um, try to build something new, almost like you're almost like you're rearranging the same song, but within the song itself. So I'm like gonna, but it, I don't really know where it's gonna go yet. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna do more of this. So. And it's gonna be great. I'm I'm super stoked about this. Uh, any EQ mixing tips? I feel like my stuff is either really sparse or that the various parts are fighting each other. I know how to cut low end from most tracks, but it's hard for me to hear a big difference when doing A B of my mixes. Yeah, it's um, that is EQ and mixing is definitely super hard. Uh, I'm not gonna like even I still have a hard time with it. like this track. I feel uh, still like a lot of the parts are fighting each other. There's a lot of mid-range um, and I can look at like, this is the full mix. And we can look at like, see there's a lot going on everywhere, but not much on the high end. So a lot of it is like filters. You wanna use filters to take things out. Um, if you like, so if you pull up like a synth and it has like a high part that you like, but a bass part that maybe you don't like, because like a lot of modern synths have like, you pull up a preset and it has like, just fills the room with sound. But maybe you like, you like part of it, but not the other. You should just use a filter and like cut out the bottom part or maybe cut out the top part, depending on what you want. Um, and that can help. And it's also good to like, um, Remember that volume, mixing the volume of everything is really important. So like you might you might uh, put in a new part and it sounds you like you're really excited about this, you write this part, you put it in and it sounds awful and you're like, what the hell? Uh, it doesn't fit at all. Always, always try pulling the fader down from zero to point to uh, negative five. 
and then listen to it again. And that may be all you need to like change change it from something that's like awful to tolerable. So yeah, volume mixing is super important. Turn it down as much as you can while still being able to hear it, I would say, and see how that goes. Use filters a lot. Uh, Cubase has a great filter that I love. It's super simple. Um, here, let's load it up on this thing. We'll uh, loop this part here so we can keep it going. Turn on looping. And I'll load this filter so you can hear it. It's called dual filter. So we insert this on there. It's this little guy. So if we, if we crank the filter up this way, it cuts out low frequencies. But it doesn't hurt the overall quality of it. Like, you still hear it still sounds good, even though I've cut out a lot of the lower frequencies. Or we can do it, do it this way. So this is super useful for mixing. So if you can find in your own digital audio workstation like an equivalent filter thing that's like really simple like that, it's great for mixing and you should totally use it. Uh, okay, we got another question. How do you know when it's best to reuse or use very similar notes to a previous part of the track and when it's best to start using a different set? That, uh, a lot of that's gonna be up to your intuition. Like, just listen to it. Um, one thing I like to do is I will, once I have like a part, oh, maybe I'll add a new, a new like, um, a new part that's like maybe the same notes but played by a different instrument. And I'm like, well, is this too repetitive? I don't know. So what I'll actually do is I'll go back to the beginning of the track. Um, I will actually turn off my screen, like turn it off and then play, like hit the space bar to play and listen to it without being able to see it. And that's really good for mixing for one thing, but it's also really good to like listen to it. It just makes you listen to it as though you uh, are like the final listener, like you're somebody who's just listening to it the first time. And when you can't edit anything, listening to it without seeing it, and you can't do it, you can't touch anything, it, it makes you listen to it differently. And it may actually help give you insight whether or not it's like too repetitive. Um, one way to get the most out of a melody is to like uh, have it play with different instruments. Like, just copy the melody to a new instrument that's you know can also play the same thing, and you know modify notes as needed or like the the velocities of notes, and have it play right after the previous part, and you can use the same melody but it. Uh, sounds new and it actually can really help like re it reinforces the melody in the listener's mind and like uh it adds like this kind of energy to it when one one instrument plays the melody then another instrument plays it it gives it this kind of like conversational feel and it's really cool <clears throat> uh yeah dalton i will totally do more of these I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be doing it hopefully once a week. Um, and let's see here, we got another question. Have you ever come up with a riff or chord progression, got really excited about it, and then realized either you or someone else had used it before? Yes, uh, that's called cryptomnesia. Uh, and yeah, it's happened to me a lot. In fact, when I was doing the uh, the documentary, I wrote this whole piece that I was really loving. And then I realized I was just redoing uh, Solar Sailor from the Daft Punk's uh, Tron soundtrack. <laughs> and so I just sort of abandoned it. Cause, and it sounds really cool. It's too bad. But uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll say it's a remix and release it for free. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, that happens a lot. <clears throat> All right, so... So actually, in fact, it was just we were just talking about the using the same melody uh, with a different instrument, and I was thinking of trying it. So we've got this part here. Um, so let's listen to it again. Okay. 
Um, okay, so I want to use this thing again with a different instrument. So let's insert something uh, in there. And well, I, you know, I was thinking of a Celesta, like a, some hammer instrument. And let's uh, let's put it in there. Let's see what happens. Okay, so this is contact, which is one of my favorite things ever. And Uh, let's see here. We've got some comments. Sorry, everybody. Uh, do you record with Vintage Warmer on the beginning, or do you add it when you feel like you're hearing completion of the track, or nearing the completion of the track? Yeah, usually I, I add Vintage Warmer near the end. Um, and I was doing, like, when I was making the documentary, uh, I did, like, a test run of this track. Um, so I put on the Vintage Warmer. Uh, vintage Warmer is a compressor that sort of simulates a, uh, an analog compressor and it kind of like boosts the signal and adds a really nice warm sound to it. So I always put it, before I put out any track, I put on that vintage warmer on the final mix and it makes it sound awesome. And like everything of mine has that vintage warmer on it. So like everything post FTL. So like Starcrawler's Gravity Ghost, uh, all of my albums all have vintage warmer on them because it sounds amazing. So anyway, what were we doing? We were gonna do a a Celesta here. So this is the the default contact factory library, and uh, it's like an orchestral library, and it's really good for what you for what you're paying for. So here's like a Celesta. It sounds amazing. I love the sound of this. Uh, let's see here. We'll turn down the reverb on this thing and we'll add our own reverb instead. Let's make that a little bigger, change the color, make it like a green. So then we just copy this, so I do like a double, so we have it again. And then we can move it anywhere, and so we'll put it here in the Celeste. And it's probably not going to sound great off the bat, but let's try it anyway. We'll start here. Yeah, see, you can't even hear it. You can hear it a little bit. So, actually, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, let's add some reverb to it so it sounds a little more full. So this is called Reverence, and it's another reverb that's default in Cubase, and I really like it. Uh, let's see here. We've been doing, yeah, let's try the Dutch concert. No, let's do, for the documentary, I was doing one of these English chapels, and then we turned down the mix. Because if you just have it, here, I'll show you guys what, what I'm doing here. So let's solo this, and then... You can hear what it sounds like with a 100% English Chapel reverb. And then we can turn it down. So, you can hear the difference here if we go and if we, let's try it again here. So we can turn it off. on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's subtle, but I like it. it. Sounds cool. So let's see here. It does, it doesn't quite fit. Well, maybe we can turn it up. Actually, let's turn it up the original instrument. Sounds like the other problem is is the striking of them. It's it's the velocity is too high. Let's turn all of these down. So this is these these uh, lines represent how basically how hard the instrument is being struck. So I'm going to turn down the velocity because Celeste always sounds better when it's a little lower.
it's still pretty like clumsy sounding like uh, but it I don't think it matters too much when all this other stuff is accompanying it but if it does tend to matter then we'll go back and we'll edit each individual each individual thing so okay let's let's see here we got some questions uh, yes I have pretty much always used Cubase uh, I when I was a teenager, I got uh, Sonic Foundry Acid, which was like a like a loop-based tool. That was my first thing. I actually ordered it out of a paper catalog, which tells you how long ago it was. And um, I used to go like uh, uh, the artist Hesper Jesper Kid. I don't. I never know how to pronounce his name, but he's he's done a lot of cool soundtracks. He did soundtracks to the, some of the early Assassin's Creed games, uh, MDK2, Hitman. Uh, I w I was a huge fan, even though I didn't really play a lot of the games that he did music for. I loved his music, and he was a huge influence on me. But anyway, he used to have a little forum on his website where you could talk to him. So I would go on there a lot, and I would ask him like questions about what I should do, what I should use if I wanted to get into this into this industry and I was like what do you use to make your music and he was like Cubase and I was like sold and by the time I actually had enough money like when I was like making my own money and I could actually afford it I got Cubase in uh, 2004 2005 something like that and so that's what I started on and I've been using it ever since so it's been about 11 years 12 years, something like that, since I started it, and that's, uh, I love it. Uh, I hear FL Studio is awesome. I, I don't know if you should necessarily, people, a lot of people really don't like Cubase. I, I love it just because it's what I've been using forever, so I'm, I'm not really, uh, maybe not a really good, uh, source of information on that. I might be kind of biased. Uh... Do you ever play the melody via bass, or is that a terrible idea? Uh, it's not necessarily a terrible idea. Uh, funk music, sometimes that's the only melody, is the bass. Uh, but usually you don't. Usually you have the bass line play something else, or its own simpler melody. The problem with bass is that it's really hard for human ears to differentiate the notes. Um, so... When you play a lot of notes in succession on a bass, on like a really standard bass, uh, it's going to sound muddy and indistinct and maybe awful. So it's usually better to do simpler melodies on bass, if at all. Or if you're like a super skilled bass player, you can you can kind of go nuts. But uh, in general, you want to keep it simple. Uh, so let's hear. Oh, I was going to try doing, let's see here, you're going to hear me like start and stop things a lot really fast and I apologize if that's jarring. Let's try it without one of these. Cool. What about this? That's kind of cool. So this funky thing here, let's, uh, I'll show you guys what this is. Let's uh, loop that section. Oh, oh. What am I doing? There we go. Uh, turn the loop on, and we've got it soloed. This is one of my favorite tools, which is called uh, Signal. I'm gonna load it up here. Actually, for some reason, the display isn't working. I don't know why. But anyway, it's so you load up two different instruments and you set like uh, patterns for them. This is really simple. There's a lot more you can do, but you can set up patterns for each and like effects on it, and then you can just play it and it sounds really cool. Uh, 
So this is like a sine wave and a muted guitar sample. And then they're played at like 16th notes on each one. This one a little less, this one more. But it's really fun to play with. So when you guys actually hear the documentary soundtrack, when I can finally like release it and you can see it, uh, Signal was like a huge part of the whole thing. There should be like uh, more visuals going on, but I don't know. Signal's really buggy. As much as I love it, it's very uh, weird and buggy, and sometimes it doesn't load properly. And oh, it sounds so good, so fun. Anyway, do you use that in other music? I always assume more of a simple delay. Yeah, usually I use simple delay. This is a new thing that I got. This signal tool. Uh, most of the time, it's just like I do a. <clears throat> simple arpeggio myself and then uh, add like a, a cool delay but uh, the signal tool is really good for just like getting together like a really full cool sound really quickly um, so I don't know if I like either of these things actually let's see what it sounds like to add a delay to this Celesta let's see here and really simple. Let's move the reverb down here so that the delay comes for it. Let's see our stereo delay. It's doing way too much going, too much going on here. Hang on. Let's do that. Let's turn that down. I don't know if I like that. Let's try a different delay. Mono delay. Let's just do a really simple thing. So we do uh, eighth note dotted, which is one, of, which is one of my favorite delays. You hear it all the time in most of my music, and uh, especially in FTL. Leave it in for now and see how it goes. If we don't like it, we can take it out. Let's get the sound. Turn this down a little. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Still not really liking it. But, uh,. That's fine. We can do other things. Hey, we could try. Let's let's do some experiments. Experimental stuff. Uh, let's do like. Um, let's hang on. Give me a second here. Okay. Let's load up a new track. Let's say like a synth. Let's say FM8. Um. FM8 is really fun. It's very simple, easy to use, and it has great, like, warm sounds. Uh, so then we'll take this, we'll double it, we'll move a new one down here. We're going to mute that Celesta because we still don't really, I don't know if I really like it yet. And now we'll just go through some presets and see what different things sound like. Some of this is going to sound awful, just keep in mind. And that's part of the fun. <laughs> so there's, like, a yeah, it doesn't sound very good, right? Ooh. This is part of the fun. Ooh. Okay, so these are like presets that I've saved that I like for, for whatever reason. Most of them are going to sound awful, but let me see here. What does this, no, what does this sound like? Ooh.
That one doesn't play fast enough. Ooh, this is kind of neat. Uh, whoops, I thought it was... Let me turn on the looping here. It's actually kind of cool. Hang on, let's turn this down a little. What if we have this and this? Something else is wrong with this one. What? Oh, you know what? So this is kind of an organ sound, right? Sounds a bit like an organ. Sounds really neat by itself, huh? Um... What about, what about with the Celesta? Whoops, what did I just do? Undo whatever that was. Ooh, that's kind of cool. This might need to have its... We need to cut the bottom out of this. It's a little too... Let's try it. So we're loading up that filter. We could also do something else like this. We could take all of this, we're going to grab the entire melody for the Celesta, and we're going to... Uh, let's see here. We're going to go to MIDI, we're going to transpose it up 12 semitones, which is we're going to move it up one octave. It might be too high for the Celesta, but we're going to try it anyway. It's kind of cool. I kind of like it. Uh, what about with other things? Uh, let's turn off the soloing so now we can hear everything. Let's turn this down a little too. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So we just took the same material that we already had and we added two new instruments that play the same part. Uh, one of it plays an octave above, and one of it plays at the same octave as this thing previously. And we got a whole new part out of it. Um, so at this point, I like to go back and listen to how it sounds in context. It's really, really important to get context. So what's, what's going to happen when you do music production is you're going to get really fixated on like one area, like what we did. You know, you keep improving and changing and improving it and like tweaking it here and there, adding things. Uh, but it's really important to stop that occasionally, go back and listen to the whole thing. In this case, I'm just going to listen to back from here for now and hear how it sounds in the context of everything before it.
pretty cool. Uh, one thing that I will probably add is right here. Um, right here, where it transitions from this part to this part, um, I will probably add some kind of flourish. Uh, but that's I usually do that kind of stuff later. Um, uh, I will like look at where there are obvious transitions from one part to another, and I'll like add in little flourishes or inter little interesting things, and that is super important. So always do that. Um, so now we have this other part here. You heard this before, right, you guys? So that part could be used again too. So we could like take this and like make a new thing out of it. In fact, we could do it like let's just for the hell of it. Let's just try uh, making the Celesta play it. What's it gonna sound like? I don't know. Could be awesome. Let's do that and this one. This isn't really like I'm not necessarily going to use this unless it sounds amazing. All right, right off the bat, it's probably going to sound bad. Whoops, oh yeah, everything's... Or not sound like anything. All right, let's try it again. This is kind of cool, but... Uh, or what if we did, like, let's, let's take this and move this back down here to where that original thing was. And let's turn it down. Turn it down a little. Take this. This was too loud. So we're going to we're going to reduce the volume of all the hits on the Celesta. So we go take this, lower it way down. It's kind of this awful what is that? Yeah, well, whatever. Uh, so that actually sounds kind of cool, right? Um, another interesting thing you do is take this same melody and put it on something that uh, you wouldn't normally think to. So we've got that loop thing. What's it going to sound like if we put this there? It's a little too loud for, the, or a little too high. So let's take it and move it down. Uh, I'm just going to grab this and move it down. It's going to sound weird. Let's move it down one more octave. All right. What's that sound like? Hey, you're welcome. Uh, glad to help. This is uh, this has been way more fun than I was expecting. So, so that's kind of neat. Let's what if we just take out that flute thing. Not too into it, I guess. It's pretty cool, but but you got to do this kind of stuff. You got to experiment. I did like the Celesta and flute part together with the Celesta really quiet. Uh, let's move this up here and see what that sounds like. Ooh, who knows? Ooh. Neat. Maybe we should just like turn it into like a more standard baseline. Or let's get rid of that. Let's see what. Maybe it just needs this. Ooh, yeah. Let's 
Okay, so, so far we've just added so much more content without even writing any new parts. Um, we just, we've just taken old parts and recycled them with new instruments, and we get a lot more use out of them. Uh, yeah, go ahead and tell Facebook, that's fine. I should probably like tweet about it again, huh? But yeah, let's let's uh, go back and listen to the whole thing because we need more context. Okay, so that last part, it's kind of an awkward transition. Like, it's not very exciting to go from this part to the other one. So, might need something there, but... Hello, 121GW! Yes, I am Ben Prunty, that's me. Uh, this is the first... Uh, I'm just doing sort of a test of the creative live stream, but it turned into an actual creative live stream somehow. Um, this turned out to be a, a lot easier to do than I expected. Um, uh, well, the technical part was really hard setting it up, but uh, just being on the camera and talking about this turned out to be a lot easier than I thought it would be. So this last part, not so great, right? I mean, you know, it sounds cool on its own. Something's missing. Maybe this needs to drop out. We can also, like, look at this other stuff that we have here, like... We've got this bass line. We could like have it come back. That might be cool. Let's try that. Maybe not. That's kind of neat. Not the best though. I don't know. Not too into it. Let's delete it for now. Do you use real instruments often? Uh, not too often. Uh, I did. I put guitar a little bit on the documentary soundtrack that I did. Um, I have an electric guitar, and I'm playing. I'm learning to play it, and I occasionally use it in uh, in my tracks. Sometimes I will do like the odd percussion here and there of like hitting something and recording it. Uh, but most of the time, I'm, I'm pure synths. 
What about adding a slower bass line from the beginning? Oh yeah, let's try that. Let's double it and we drag it over here. Let's see what that sounds like. Oh yeah, that's way better. So that actually sounds really cool. Good idea, Fire Flazer. Um, yeah, it sounded way cooler with that in. So now, let's just want one more experiment. We'll add this thing in to like add more energy to it. I'm guessing we're not gonna wanna keep it, but gotta experiment. Context. So we're going to go back here and we're going to listen to it all the way through again. Got to keep doing it. Always listen to the whole thing for context. So yeah, pretty cool. How long is this now? So we're at about 2.20. I can, I can hit this little button and see like uh, time code instead of uh, measures. So it's a little bit, it's like two minutes and 30 seconds. It's a pretty short song so far still, but you know, it takes a while to make stuff. Um, so yeah, it's sounding pretty cool. But we're reusing stuff a lot, so we, we're gonna have to change things soon and make like a new, make like a whole new sound. And that's when it gets messy and difficult and requires a lot of work. This is like the easy part where you're just like copying stuff and making it sound cool. Uh, but it will probably get more difficult as we go. Hey, do you guys have any other questions? Sfax asks, how is the documentary coming as a whole, or is that top secret? Uh, as far as I know, the documentary is done. Everything's finished. Because um, when I, at the very end of my music making, they gave me the final cut of the film. So my music was the last thing to be added. 
So I'm pretty sure it's all done. And now they're just like uh, probably doing more businessy stuff now. I know they need like a movie poster and such, which they don't have yet. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about it, but they still haven't really said much about it yet. So, uh, but yeah, I wrote a hundred minutes of music for it in two months, which was insane. Uh, so, hey, VX, VX says, uh, how did you manage to pipe Cubase audio through the stream? Well, I'll tell you, it is, uh, it was kind of a bitch to do, but, so what you have to do is, there is a VST plugin, VSTs are, uh, plugins for Cubase and other audio workstations where you can... Uh, add synthesizers or effects or whatever, any kind of thing that you can very easily load up into your workstation. Uh, that's what all of these synths and stuff are, VSTs. Uh, so you go to the, the stereo out mix, the final mix, and you add this free plugin called Voxengo Recorder. And it's very simple. And you tell it to output to like Windows standard like uh, audio. Because I'm using a Scarlett audio device to make music on, but that sort of bypasses Windows. And OBS, which is the software I use to uh, broadcast all this, OBS can't really capture audio from uh, an external audio interface, which is what you need to use if you're gonna do like serious music making. So, uh, you put in this Voxengo recorder and it, and it like grabs the audio at the end of the chain and then pipes it back through Windows and then OBS can capture it. Uh, you need to have a fairly beefy machine to pull this off, I think. Um, but yeah, it took a lot of finagling to get it without latency and all. And it still has some latency, but it's slow enough that it doesn't really seem to matter. I don't think any of you guys haven't really complained or anything about it being weird. Anyway, uh, Allison asks, documentary aside, is there a minimum length you always try to have, or is it more like you said initially, when you feel like you've conveyed the message of the song? Uh, a lot of it depends on the needs of the of the uh, project. So like, like say with FTL, I wanted to have each track be pretty long since you're going to be hearing them a lot. So it's like if it's really short, it's going to be repeating a lot and you're not going to you're going to get sick of it quicker. So I wanted to have each track be like between 3 to 5 minutes long. And usually 3 to 5 minutes is what I go for. Uh I don't usually like having stuff uh shorter than 3 minutes. Uh but you know, it depends. I have I have some tracks that are like two minutes long. You know, it depends, again, on whether I feel satisfied or not at the end of it. Uh, do you ever run into CPU issues? Says, issues with so many instances of plugins. I'm in the process of upgrading because I want because once I have more than two or three contact instruments loaded, my computer flips me off. <laughs> yes, and uh, I used to have that as well. So one way to get around that. I never have it anymore because this machine is so beefy. I have like a quad core, like 3.4 gigahertz CPU and like 16 gigs of RAM. So uh, the it's not as much of an issue for me anymore. However, if you do have that issue, and but you want to keep working, so this is what I did in FTL. Once you load a, a whole bunch of... Uh, instruments you're gonna it's gonna start slowing down right and it's gonna start dying on you so what you can do in at least in cubase is cubase has this little button here and it says freeze instrument channel and what that does is it unloads the channel it just it it stop it puts away whatever the instrument was uh, and replaces it with an audio file that sounds Exactly. Basically, it just records the audio of that whole thing and drops that in. And that's way easier for your CPU to process, just like a big audio file. And so if you have a part that's like basically done or it's like at least somewhat uh, in good shape, uh, you can freeze it. Here, I'll do it right now. I don't really do this anymore. but So freeze instrument and then we hit OK. And it will actually, it basically is like exporting it as an audio file.
now you'll see that the the controls have now been grayed out, which means you can't edit this thing anymore. I can't edit any of it. You can see those little, little lock icon too, but you can still hear it just fine. So that's how you get around the CPU load issue. Um, that will help a lot. But so like, but then it's like it gets a little clunky because you're like, oh, you want to go back and edit something. You have to unfreeze it, edit it, and then freeze it again. But like, it's still better than nothing, and it will help you a lot. And I did that a lot with uh, FTL uh, back when I was doing everything on a laptop. Uh, I had a I had a MacBook Pro, <clears throat> and it was great. It's really good, but uh, it definitely would start to choke after I had too many instruments. So I'm gonna I'm gonna unfreeze this, and it loads the instrument back up and keeps going. But yeah, it's great when you're doing like orchestra samples on like a machine that can't handle it. You can like write the part and then freeze it and then keep going. Um, wow, 20 people on the stream now. Hi everybody. Let's listen to this whole thing over again so you can hear it. Since you if you guys are new here, so this was a, a track that I was working on for the documentary. Uh, I didn't end up using it for the documentary, so now I can just do whatever I want with it. Uh, so you can hear it. We've added about a minute more. All this stuff here at the end, this everything here, was stuff we added today. Anyway, let's start over from the beginning. Okay, so now you've heard the whole thing. Uh, okay, so we got a couple of uh, questions. Fireflazer says, since this track isn't in the documentary, will there be any way for us to get it when it is finished? Like, could you do a special album of tracks from the creative live stream? I think you got the right idea. Yeah, I'm, this will definitely be released because I really like it. I like this track, so I will find some way to release it. Uh, and yeah, I was also thinking of like, if I do a lot of original stuff just for the live stream, We'll definitely do like a live stream album. Uh, that would be really fun. Um, Sfax asked, do you always save your songs as CPR or do you convert it to something else to save space? Uh, well, the CPR files don't really take that much space, so it's not really an issue. Also, I have two giant hard drives on this computer, so space is never a problem. Um, so don't bother. Uh, 
also, I'm thinking of doing... So, if those of you just joining, um, I'm Ben Prunty, and I'm thinking of doing a creative live stream like once a week. And I'm also thinking of doing a Patreon to support this. Um, like, you know, I, I... The majority of my money comes from soundtrack sales and my... my uh, contract work as as a composer, uh, but this this doing this live stream takes time and it takes like equipment or whatever. <laughs> That's how you pronounce your last name. Yes, Prunty. Uh, anyway, um, it takes it takes time and and it, I want to do get some more specialized equipment for it because I right now I'm talking to a microphone and I have headphones on but I can't hear myself through the headphones so I want to do like get a mixer and like uh, just a better setup for this um, so yeah it takes time and money and I want to be able to justify the time spent doing on it and so I'm thinking of doing a patreon so if you guys would be interested in like helping fund this project uh, I would be super appreciative so let me know if that's something that you would be interested in. And like, if you're Patreon, we would come up with, I would come up with some cool rewards. Like Allison and I will try to come up with ideas for rewards for Patreon supporters. Um, maybe you could get like, if we did do a live stream album, you could get it for free and before anyone else. Um, and I don't know what else. We could come up with other rewards and it would be cool. So... Yeah, whatever, you know, let me know if that seems like a cool idea to you guys, because uh, I definitely want to know. Um, well, Patreon is not a, f not a paywall, in because Patreon's voluntary subscription. I would be doing this no matter what. Uh, you should definitely read about Patreon if you don't know about it yet, but it's definitely, it's, it's entirely voluntary. Um, so, yeah, it's not, there would never be anything behind a paywall. Uh, but we'd still want to do, like, bonuses for people who do have, uh, who do fund the Patreon. But otherwise, the, the live stream itself will happen whether or not like, even if I got zero funding on the Patreon, I would still do it. Um, it's The idea behind Patreon is that you help pay so that everybody gets to have it. Um, yeah, I think it would be, I think it would be great. And I'm glad you guys think it would be pretty cool, too. Yeah, signed copies of FTL Vinyl. Well, we'll see... I'm, I'm excited to to do that as like promotions as giving away copies of the vinyl when it comes out <clears throat> FTL disco track for the win yeah that'll happen eventually all right let's uh let's listen to this again I still don't know, quite know what to do with this part So, hmm, we can try doing like, so there's another technique we can do, which is like, it's really simple, where we can, let's grab this. This is that cool rolling bass line. One thing we can do that's really simple, uh, we can try moving this like a fifth up or a fifth down. 
So that's seven uh, semitones. And that's like an easy way to like change the way it sounds while keeping it in the same key. Oh man, I'm not used to having my hair like this. Usually you guys are, see me with my hair like combed, but I didn't comb it today. All right, so let's try this. Like we'll move it up. Uh, we'll go to the MIDI thing, transpose. Let's move it up uh, seven semitones. I don't know what this is gonna sound. It may sound awful. Let's just try it though. That's actually kind of cool. Uh, I'm gonna try it. Uh, we're gonna undo that. I'm gonna try moving it down seven semitones instead. Uh, select all, transpose. But I like that, we might just keep that that way. But let's try this first. Oops, oh, I think I just, oh, uh, redo, there we go. Midi transpose seven semitones. So that actually sounded pretty cool. So then, so here's where you're going to hear my awful keyboard skills, and it's going to be really embarrassing. But, uh, so then I just like, we're still, I believe we're still in the same key. Okay, here's one cool tip for music writers. Uh, when you're writing a melody for the first time, it's best to pick something that sounds kind of like a flute. Because um, other things may kind of destroy your melody. But a flute is like a really good neutral instrument. And I'm not the only one who says this, this is like actual, <laughs> actual composers. Uh, classical composers will also say this that uh, composing for flute is a good way to start composing with like a new melody. <laughs> I, did, I did miss that. Making music literally just guesstimating how many semitones you move. Yep, you're gonna find a lot of like uh, <laughs> of mysteries about composing music. Uh, a lot of it's just sort of flailing around until you find something that sounds cool. So we're gonna just like kind of flail around until it sounds cool. Uh, we, I was thinking of doing like a slower melody for this part so like Uh, 
the flute yeah part of it's clear that it's clear sound it's it's kind of neutral um it doesn't it's it's a constant sound too like it'll it'll stay for as long as you need it and like you can just let go when you don't want it there anymore um so it's good for like you don't know how long each note you're going to write is going to be yet and the flute is like versatile because of that so i think that's why they they recommend it however you know like i in my experience i also find it better but i don't know exactly why i think it's very subtle wow 24 people viewing now hi everybody um thanks for joining this this test live stream that turned into a real live stream somehow yeah i don't like that start this is a good place to start Having just talked about, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for joining the creative live stream. Uh, so, just after talking about using flute to write your melodies, I'm going to go switch over to the Celesta and try that too. enjoying it uh it's it's been way more fun than i expected hey master sword thanks for joining uh so this was originally for the documentary that i did a couple months ago or a month ago uh, whoops i kind of killed the loop there uh so i didn't end up using it in the in the in the uh, documentary, so I'm just doing what I want with it. And it's become part of the live stream. And I'm trying to write a new melody for this part, where I've moved everything up a fifth, but I can't, haven't found anything yet. <laughs> yeah, the thing, the title of the file is Where's My Money? It's a line from the from the uh, documentary. aggressively hey guys here's my file it's called where's my money hint hint uh no yeah it was just a line from the documentary um well since there's so many new people let's start over from the beginning so you guys can hear the whole thing and i'm sure everyone else won't mind hearing it all over again so the core well i'm you know i'm gonna go back to the very beginning here and talk about what the core of this track was So everything that I wrote is based on this one chord progression that's been turned into an arpeggio, and I'm going to play it here for you right now. Let's uh, solo this. So 
so here we go. You're going to hear this is the core sound that everything else is based on, the hook basically. So it's three chords, uh, E minor, D major, and then C major. Uh, and then the fifth note has been inverted on each one. So it, so you have like, so E minor is, uh, yeah, this. This is E minor, but we've inverted the last note, which we call the fifth. So you got uh, first, third, fifth. I know it sounds weird. It's really the first, second, and third note, but whatever. Uh, you gotta know like music theory. So anyway, but we took the fifth note and we moved it down one octave. So instead of doing this, we do this. So that's the basic idea behind this one very simple chord progression and everything's sort of based around that. So let's listen to the whole thing. So that's it so far. Actually, I have kind of an idea of where, where I want to take this. Um, so I'm glad you guys like it. <laughs> it's It came together really well, and I'm enjoying working on it. Uh, Arachnobot asks, uh, do you make your own patches? Sometimes I make my own patches. Most of the time, I take a preset, I will modify it a little bit, and then add effects to it. Um, Making my own patches I find to be too time-consuming to bother with, especially because presets usually sound way better than anything I can make. So <clears throat> I will just take stuff that's already made and modify it from there. Um, this is a big mix of different instruments. Uh, I don't really have them properly labeled right now, but Massive is a big thing that I'm using apparently. That is um, a synthesizer. Looks like uh, this looks really cool. I still haven't really learned to use it that much. I usually just load up presets and, and go from there, but I'd like to learn it. Um, 
we use FM8 for a lot of things. Like I think this is FM8, yeah. So FM8 is really simple, um, has pretty simple controls. It has a cool little arpeggiator so you can make patterns, which is really fun. And then these are like basic controls. And then this stuff, which is nuts, I don't really know how to use it. Again, I usually load presets and go from there. Uh, okay. What else we got? Uh, is this for Skytorn? No, this was originally for. Um, this was originally for the documentary that I was working on, and it didn't end up being used in the documentary, so I just. Um, now I'm just doing what I want with it. Okay, so I'm taking this base part that I just did, and I'm doubling it here, so now it goes in twice. Now, I have this idea of what I want to do with it here, but let me let me run it by you guys. and we'll also transpose it up. What does this sound like? Okay, that sounds pretty cool, but it's still kind of quiet. Maybe let's... Let's move it down a whole octave now. Transpose one octave. Some questions. Uh, oh yeah, VX the shift down thing. I gotta remember that. That's really cool. Um, I know there's like so many shortcuts in Cubase that I just like don't remember or know or keep track of, and that shift down thing I gotta remember. Uh, so yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> Civilians. Uh, oh yeah, so the documentary is. Um, it's not out yet. Uh, it's recently been finished, as far as I know, and uh, it's about, I, I think I can say what it's about. It's about bitcoins and cryptocurrencies and like the, sort of the controversies surrounding them, uh, and I did a massive soundtrack for it, and I'm excited to release it as like a big album. It's going to be really cool. Um, but yeah, Patches, Patches is just a way that music makers say uh, like a preset thing in like so you load up a synthesizer and then you load up the um, pre-made settings that makes a cool sound uh, and that's like that's the uh, that's what a patch is basically <clears throat> it comes from the old days when synthesizers had like patch cables and uh, and like it was a more literal term of like a patch over the controls. Anyway, yeah. Um, but anyway, I love this. I like where this is going already.
here and here. We're setting markers and then I tell it to loop. Super cool though. What else do we have here? Oh yeah, we got this like uh Let's try that thing. really simple uh, and my rhythm is terrible but we can just quantize it and here's the big secret of uh, the big embarrassing secret of music producers so if you look at these notes my, my timing is all off I was just writing it as I went I just sort of improvised this as and you guys saw it sort of as it happened but if you look at it closely man I don't even hit these I hit these notes terribly like I'm not even close to being on time but I just hit Q and bam everything moves into place well sort of some of it did not move into place. Uh, this one did not. So these are all triplets. Um, quarter note triplets? I don't remember. Anyway. Uh, and I played it a little too loud, so I'm going to turn it down here. Uh, not the volume, but I'm turning the velocity of the notes down so that I'm striking them a little quieter. So now let's listen to it. <laughs> Blame any out of time stuff on latency. Yes, it's all latency issue. So I want to add something here. there and we're going to turn that down a bit. So now let's listen to it with that there. Still a little too loud. So let's turn it down a bit. Just added this little thing. Oh, maybe 
maybe we should do the baseline too. Maybe if we do, what's it gonna sound like at 12, at seven semitones up? It still sounds cool like a bass line. Allison's just like in the next room. <laughs> Several <laughs> wants you to say hi on camera. Come on in and say hi. I don't know if she's gonna come. I might have to go grab her. <clears throat> so this this bell thing that we just did is cool, but it's not like it's not really a full melody on its own. I still want to do something else with it. All right, uh, I think it's time to go back and listen to everything in context. Uh, let me go. Let me go grab her because she. I don't think she saw you guys tell her to, or heard me tell you to come on camera. I'll be right back, guys. Here, I'll play the track for you. Okay, 
Whoop, and then it repeats because I have the loop on. Uh, so yeah, that's where we are now. Um, so hey, thanks Arachnobot. I'm glad you like it. Uh, this has been so fun. Way more fun than uh, I expected it to be. Uh, I think I'm probably going to wrap it up too because I got to eat. I'm hungry. Um, but thanks everybody for joining and uh, we I will definitely keep going with this uh, I guess we'll just make this track uh, the live stream track for now and I'll do this from now on I'm going to try to do it at least once a week I don't know when um, not sure what day I'll do Saturday does seem kind of like a cool day to do it on um, but I don't know don't know for sure. Do you plan to put this track in any specific projects? Uh, yeah, it's not going to be in the documentary, so it will get released in some form. I don't know yet. Uh, some people in the chat were suggesting doing like a specific live stream album, like album made up of the tracks I made in the live stream. And if I do the Patreon, Patreon supporters will get it like for free or whatever. Uh, but I'll release it otherwise on Bandcamp. And but anyway, yes, I'm thinking of doing a Patreon for this. Um, Patreon, if you don't know, is a voluntary subscription service. Uh, if you like a project, you can do like a monthly uh, sort of donation towards the project. Um, and I will do it every week or something. And you don't need to. Um, you don't need to support the Patreon because it, it'll happen no matter what. But the Patreon is like voluntary and you'll get some sort of like rewards i haven't really thought up what it is going to be yet like what the rewards will be but uh we'll have some perks for being a patreon supporter um and yeah i'm not really sure when it will happen but uh we'll definitely do it once a week and now that i know that i can do it and it sounds good and it, the stream actually works we'll keep doing it for sure but yeah i think i'm gonna peace out because yeah I'm getting hungry <laughs> I did not expect to be doing this for this long uh, I was just gonna test it to make sure that it all worked but uh, yeah lots of people joined in it was really fun and uh, but yeah thanks everybody for joining I'm glad you enjoyed it I hope you guys learned something from this and yeah you get to see a lot of the production process uh, I didn't do as much writing as I usually do. I only wrote like one little part there. But but anyway, yeah. Thanks everybody. I will uh, I will keep you guys posted. Follow me on Twitter. Subscribe to this uh, subscribe to this channel. You can scroll down from the video on the page, and you can see information about my Twitter and like how to follow me. Uh, follow me on Facebook too. It's facebook.com/slash Ben Prunty Music. And uh, Allison manages that page, and she gets me to write all sorts of cool stuff, so it's kind of like a mini blog now, so you should to totally follow that as well. But anyway, yeah. Oh, thanks, everybody. And uh, I will see you guys later. Stop stream. See ya.